Welcome to this special presentation of Investing in Psychedelics, brought to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with CFN Media. And we're back. It's panel number three, Investing in Psychedelics. That's panel number three out of six today of CFN Media and CSC Canadian Securities Exchange's presentation of Investing in Psychedelics. Now, thank you if you watched us in the first and second uh, program. Uh, we had great turnout, lots of questions in the box next to uh, next to my right here. And I uh, just want to make sure that everyone's engaged for this one. We're, we're going to go for another, I think, two hours, three hours. So uh, this is the third session. I'm really excited about this one. And uh, thankfully, you're in good hands because we have a great moderator. You might know her already. Her name's Anna Saren. And I'm going to ask Anna to join the room now and do uh, do her thing. So, Anna, you're ready to pop up. And there she is, folks. Thank you, James. Um, well, I hope everyone's getting as much as I am getting from this. I've learned so much. I think, I think uh, you know, this was a very important time for us to do this because um, it's coming to market. Everyone's excited, but there really is so much to learn about it. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm just so thrilled with the people that have joined us so far and the people that are joining us today. Um, they really are all thought leaders. Uh, you know, this panel especially, um, I found of great interest, just, you know, the applications that these psychedelics are being used for and the potential that they might do to, you know, aid in mental illness and addiction and, and other ailments. Um, so without further ado, if I could please welcome Ian McDonald. He's with uh, Bright Minds Bioscience. Hi, Ian. Hi. Uh, Timothy Ko, he's CEO of Entheon Biomedical. Hi, everyone. Hi, Timothy. And Dr. Roger McIntyre, he is CEO of Champignon Brands. Hi, Anna, and hi, everybody. And finally, um, uh, Ronan Levy, who is CEO of Field Trip Health. Hi, Ronan, how are you? Doing well today, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, I will mention uh, just just for our viewers that are out there, um, I see lots of numbers up there. If you followed us all morning, um, thank you so much for spending your day with us. That's that's amazing of all of you to take the time to listen to what these fantastic people have to say. Um, there was an interview that I did with Dr. Roger McIntyre a few weeks back. It is on our CSC YouTube page on the psychedelics or investing in psychedelics playlist. Um, Roger has uh, so much much insight into the sector and and the work that can be done so I encourage you you know after you take a break from us today uh, to follow up and go back and check it out uh, it is quite something so um, why don't we start off with talking about yourselves the company you're with and why you're in the sector um, Timothy I'm, I'm tempted to start with you if you don't mind sure yeah um, my name is Timothy Ko. I'm the CEO of Antion Biomedical um, yeah and my reasons uh, for being in the psychedelic sector are deeply personal. Um, yeah, uh, this all started as far back as childhood, but uh, more recently, about three years ago, when I became responsible for the care of my brother, who was a multi decades long user. Um, yeah, I was in charge of making sure that he had access to all the right services, medications, and professionals. And over the course of about two years, um, yeah, he was in multiple uh, residential treatment programs, um, multiple mental health institutions on, you know, anxiolytics, antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, received electric convulsive therapy, um, all sorts of, you know, normal psychotherapies, as well as uh, medication assisted therapies. Um, and yeah, just seeing the, that take place over the course of two years um, and seeing the absence of efficacy and um, no real standardized or hugely evidence-based uh, way of treating addiction, um, it, yeah, it dawned on me that, um, yeah, sort of patient outcomes were really hard to determine for people uh, sort of you know, suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, sadly, I lost my brother uh, in March of last year to an overdose. Um, and then, yeah, that really lit a fire under me. And um, yeah, I knew the potential of psychedelic medicines to treat diseases of despair. And so, um, yeah, set out to find these best, brightest and smartest in the field. Uh, so we could take a deeply sort of rigorous scientific approach to bringing a psychedelic medicine into the sort of uh, stream. 
Thank you, Timothy. And, and I'm very sorry to hear about your brother and love that you have taken this, you know, lesson in life and, and your hardship to put it to good for others. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, Dr. Roger McIntyre, why don't we go to you next? Tell us about what you're doing with Champagnon Brands and, and a little bit about some of the work that you've done. This has been a, this has been a long part of your career path. So tell us about that. It really has, Anna, and, and thank you. You're right. I, I started in this area about 20, almost 25 years ago. I'm trained as a psychiatrist and I'm also a pharmacologist. I'm a professor in Toronto at the university, but I'm also a professor at two universities in the United States and Asia. And I've had a surreal privilege that's been given to me by, by people who've been affected by depression and, and related illnesses. When I started my first center uh, just over two decades ago, I would never have been envisaged it would have been First of all, it became the largest depression center in the world by volume and also the largest research center in the world where we've been developing treatments for people who have depression, pharmacologic treatments and related conditions. And to you know, pick up on, on Tim, your, your point, and it really hits home. I've in fact uh, seen too often uh, and met with uh, tens of thousands of patients and families uh, really, uh, you know, a, a narrative that Tim described. The treatments have not been sufficient. They've not got people's lives back. And I've had many, many people over the years commit suicide. And I really, in fact, felt the call to action. And the call to action wasn't just one that could be guided by passion. Passion was not going to be enough to do this. It also needed to be guided by having the human capital. In other words, having the experience to develop drugs in this area. We've developed over a hundred different compounds in my time in this space. And it became clear in my discussions with the FDA only consolidated it that for us to take potential treatments like psychedelics across the finish line, it was important that those people who've been leading the research actually do the studies, who have the track record. So Champignon represents in all ways, it represents what I think we need to do going forward. We need to have clinics that can offer and implement psychedelics as we do according to the evidence and the evidence supports intranasal and intravenous and that's it secondly what we do is we also need to have those persons who are the most expert in developing the products be the ones that shepherd this and that's what we're doing at our clinics in canada and the united states i've witnessed too many lives be negatively affected and i've seen too many medicines that should have made it that didn't make it because the people developing them don't actually have the expertise to develop them themselves. And that's gonna be critical, I think, for us to take this to success. There's a lot of risk if you don't have the expertise in doing it. And I feel like we have a champignon and what we've created is really a very high probability for success, both on the clinic side and our R&D side. So I'm extremely, extremely happy about it. And Tim's comments only reiterate why it's so important what we're doing. Absolutely. And again, thank you for the work that you're doing. I know that, like you said, it's been a 25 year path and you've probably helped many people. So thank you for that. Um, Ronan, why don't we why don't we jump to you next? Tell us tell us about Field Trip. Tell us about your experience in the sector and, and why you're doing what you're doing. Sure. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so Field Trip, uh, we're building what we think is going to be the first integrated company and in, in therapeutic psychedelics. Uh, four of the five founders in Field Trip actually came out of the Canadian medical cannabis industry. We had started uh, a company called Canadian Cannabis Clinics and a sister company called Cannabis Rx. Canadian Cannabis Clinics has grown to become the largest network of cannabis specialized medical clinics in Canada, helped well over 100,000 people access the legal medical cannabis system. Um, and and we sold Canvas RX, the sister company, to Aurora Cannabis back in 2016 and really helped Aurora grow into one of the largest producers of medical cannabis globally. We left in 2018 to, to do the next great thing, and that's when we learned about what was happening in psychedelics. Um, and having seen the experience we had with medical cannabis and just how profoundly it affected the quality of life of the patients that we worked with, uh, we saw the same opportunity to have such significant impact with psychedelics. And, you know, I think what really brings uh, Field Trip to the fore and, and, and it creates a lot of excitement is that, you know, when you look, I think when we look back in, in 20 or 30 years uh, to this time, we're going to have a bright line uh, in history 
pre-psychedelic and post-psychedelic. Not that psychedelics are new, but I think this renaissance is is new, and uh, I think it's going to fundamentally change. And we're going to look at you know the psychiatric treatments we've worked today as probably historic and somewhat barbaric, uh, and so really bringing a fresh lens and, and new eyes to this. Um, therapeutic modality, I think, is going to really engender a, a much broader adoption, greater acceptance, and, and greater treatment for a, a broader number of people. I think what really differentiates field trip to some degree to, to others in, in the sector is we really want to lean into the psychedelic and the psychotherapy aspect of it. We don't think it's a pharmacological solution. In some limited instances, they may be, but we really think it's about the psychotherapy and then the treatments and the empathy that's being catalyzed by the psychedelic molecules, not the psychedelics themselves. And, and so I think we take a different lens to, to some degree than, than other approaches to the sector, but we're excited to be here. We're working, uh, we're rolling out our clinic network uh, um, hope launched in Toronto earlier this year and plan to be up to 75 clinics over the next few years. And we're also active in drug development and actually working with plant-based psychedelics directly through a partnership in, at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. That's wonderful. And, and again, you know, I think, I think one thing that you touched on that's very important is that, um, and you can probably all agree on, this is not just a drug to be administered as, um, as a unit in itself. There is a holistic approach to using these drugs. And so, um, you know, I think something like those clinics is a start to how we figure out how to handle this on a, on a larger scale. So um, appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, Ian, let's finish off with you. Tell us about Bright Minds Biosciences and yourself and how you got into the sector. Sure. So um, I, along with I think everyone else in this panel and probably everyone listening, is have been affected um, by mental health in some way. Uh, what I came to realize is that there is a, a tremendous class of medicines called psychedelics, and they've been locked in a closet since uh, for the past 50 years. Um, so what Bright Minds Biosciences is, um, we are laser focused on creating the next generation of psychedelic medicine. These are drugs that will be superior to first generation compounds like psilocybin or LSD, um, and we believe uh, our drugs will eventually replace those uh, in use in the therapeutic setting. Put simply, our team designs molecules on an atom by atom basis to optimize them for specific disease states, uh, ranging all the way from neuro neuropsychiatric disorders like depression and PTSD, all the way to pain disorders like cluster headache. Um, our core scientific team own substantial stakes in the company and they're all veterans of biotechnology and, uh, and psychedelics specifically. Um, I'll just give you a, a brief example. One of our co-founders, Gideon Shapiro, actually started off his career at Sandoz, um, one floor below where Albert Hoffman discovered LSD. He actually went on to run that entire, the entire CNS division at Sandoz uh, and was in charge of the, uh, the whole ergot collection, which is uh, LSD and uh, similar compounds. Um, after that, he went on to found uh, several successful biotechnology companies selling for up to half a billion dollars uh, before returning to psychedelics. And his last seven years or so have been spent as CSO developing a uh, superior version of ketamine. Um, that was at an Allergan and Fidelity backed venture where they uh, successfully worked out the worked out the kinks um, uh, facing ketamine. Um, at Bright Minds, there have been millions of dollars and years of research into our portfolio. Uh, we believe we have more or less solved the key scientific issues with first generation compounds. So we have compounds in all stages of the discovery and preclinical process with some of them uh, almost ready to go into clinic today. And our strategy as a company is to um, take the most interesting indications and molecules through to, uh, through to clinic ourselves and partner on the rest. So um, just touching on a conversation that was uh, that came up in the prior conversation regarding pharmaceutical interest, we are already in discussions with uh, several pharmaceutical companies for partnership opportunities and expect to um, expect to have something there uh, at some point in the in the future. Wonderful, thank you. I, you know, I, 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 this is a really important panel and discussion that we're having today. It, it might be one of the more important ones, and I think it really is the spirit of what this drug and its ability can do. Um, you know, we're especially having this conversation June 17th, 2020, um, during a global crisis and pandemic, there's unrest 
across the globe as far as um, you know racism and uh, people dealing with poverty and people dealing with being in homes when they shouldn't be in homes with certain people and dealing with anxiety issues. So um, I think it's especially important to be having this conversation right now because I think we need to, and, and all of you have said this in our varying conversations, we need to address some of these mental illnesses and, and issues differently than we have been. They're not necessarily working the way that they were intended to. And some of the you know, statistics that have come back from the research done is is kind of amazing in this sector. So, um, you know, you guys really are the crux of why, the spirit of why we're all here, which is what these drugs can do for people. Um, you know, why don't we jump in first before we really get into it? Why don't we jump in first? Uh, Roger, maybe you want to touch on this. Um, around the medicinal side, around the research and development, and around the application to people who are dealing with depression and addiction and whatever it might be, what are the regulations right now, today? Uh, absolutely, Anna. You touched on something just a moment ago that I want to revisit. I thought that was so critical what you just said. Uh, this is a mental health assault that we've never seen before in the history books. Uh, we just published on uh, Champignon the front page of the National Post last week. A study we did at Champignon covered on the front page with the media is paying attention about the risk of suicide projected in Canada as a consequence of this particular situation we're in, uh, not delimited to Canada, also seen in the United States. So we're talking about a tsunami wave, not just of suicide, but mental disorders that are associated with suicide, like what we're talking about today, depression, substance abuse, and PTSD. The, the, the environment here, and this is critical for everyone to be familiar with, because I've witnessed what took place in cannabis, and cannabis for people with depression is actually a, a brain toxin. We don't recommend it. It hurts patients. It is powerfully linked to negative health outcomes. And I've seen the, the follies and some of the mistakes that were made, but I've also seen the mistakes that AstraZeneca made and Eli Lilly made and Janssen, folks who are friends of mine, we maintain relationships. Where the mistakes are is in fact, not knowing clearly what the target population is. And secondly, not having the human capital to implement the research. So for example, I see psychedelics the way the FDA sees psychedelics, ketamine, psilocybin, related moieties, as for persons who have a diagnosable mental disorder, full stop. And we have currently at Champignon, we have the largest volume clinics giving ketamine in a profitable, high volume way, making a difference in people's lives immediately, but critically also helping suicide, not just depression, but also suicide. These treatments have to be given within that uh, ecosystem, within that environment, respecting the laws of provinces and states. We have an organization in Toronto. We have a clinic now in Southern California. And we're going to have another half a dozen clinics before the year end. And they're all going to be respecting the best practices, the best of science, and the laws of the land. It has to be within the parameters that are regulated. And what we're talking about intravenous delivery and intranasal delivery are all that's currently recommended based on the science and what's regulated. That's what we're looking at giving. The key part about this, Anna, and this is something everyone needs to be aware of. If I did a study with Prozac today, so Prozac is an FDA approved antidepressant. It's become part of the vernacular of people in, in, in the general population. Everyone knows Prozac. If we did 100 studies with Prozac today, an effective antidepressant, only about five to maybe 20 of those studies would be positive. The other 80, 90 would be failures. Is that because the drug doesn't work? No, it's because the people doing the studies don't have the expertise on how to do the studies. And the FDA on their website has been very clear. We need to have not just the regulatory environment aligned with how they're implemented, but we need to have the human capital doing it. And this is very, very critical. And this is, in fact, what inspired me to do it this way. So in Champignon, what we're doing, we have the clinics. We're going in volume multiples. We're respecting the regulatory environment. But we're also developing our treatments in-house. We're taking out the intermediaries. And that's been identified as the flaw in drug discovery and development. And it is absolutely critical that people, in fact, understand this difference. It's easier to believe what's believable. And it's believable that the right people with the right patients who have the track record are the ones who are going to take this across the finish line. And as an advocate of this area, 
I'd have to say that this is where we've gone astray. That is, organizations that don't have the track record are the ones who are coming in and developing the products. And the FDA has said, enough's enough. And that's exactly how we're going to see these products develop. Yeah, absolutely, Roger. And, and I just want to step in there because because one thing I want to get across to our listeners is at, at a very basic level, um, you know, ketamine is legal. And I just I want you to I want you to describe what legal environment is ketamine legal at this stage? And and one question that came in that I'll actually jump to early is um, how can you apply ketamine to patients? What what framework has to happen to be able to prescribe that to a patient? Well, currently in the treatment of major depressive disorder, which is the disorder that the FDA has approved ketamine for, Health Canada, 41 countries around the world now have ketamine approved for depression, um, is the delivery through two routes only, intravenous and intranasal. Those are the only two routes that have evidence supporting it, have safety supporting it, and have the regulatory approval, full stop. And those are the only two ways it should be given clinically. And that's exactly what we do. At Champignon, though, what we're doing is we see opportunity with derivatives of these ketamine uh, products and other psychedelics like psilocybin. And those are products that we can develop at the same time. That is, we're going to develop them in the same patient populations that we also service. But the regulatory environment we needs to be very clear. These are not products that you can take home. They're not products that you walk home with with a, you know, a prescription in your back pocket. These are products that have to be given at the clinic by people who are credentialed and who have gone through the appropriate training to deliver these particular products. So they are under supervision. They under, absolutely. And yeah. psilocybin, if it gets across the finish line, it will be the same. So this will not be sitting at a retail pharmacy. It will certainly not be over the counter. It will be in specialized clinics that have the ability to do this in a way that's according to best practices. Perfect. I, I, think, it's worth, I think it's worth noting though that um, right now ketamine can be prescribed in any format. In fact, I think the most commonly used formats of ketamine to treat major depression being used in Canada and the U.S. is a form of racemic ketamine, which is prescribed off-label admittedly, but it is perfectly legal, uh, both from a legal perspective as a regulatory perspective. It's just not necessarily approved in this specific use. But there's a, there's a fundamental difference uh, between being approved for a specific use and what is and is not permitted. And I think it's important to distinguish those two considerations. Well, thank you for jumping in, Ronan, because actually I was going to go to you next. So um, listen, if you can if you can maybe give your insights as, tar as to the regulatory framework, because I know that you're involved with ketamine as well, and you have these clinics, why don't you talk to us about the regulatory framework around um, the clinics and, and how you can uh, move forward on those? Yeah, I mean, I think Roger touched on it high level, which is ketamine is a is a drug that has been prescribed for over 50 years. It's it's legal. It is controlled. So it's not something you can go to a pharmacy and generally pick up. It will be administered in a clinic by a physician uh, or a qualified medical professional. Um, but the form of ketamine that it's administered in is is something where I think there is some degree of, of latitude right now. Uh, you know, S-ketamine uh, by Janssen or, or Janssen, however it's pronounced properly has been approved. It is extremely expensive and it's not really shown that it's that much more effective than racemic ketamine, uh, which, you know, costs pennies or, or dollars per, per dose. And, and so there's a question of access to care of, you know, are people getting better outcomes necessarily paying $850 for a dose of S ketamine when dollars um, literally of racemic ketamine uh, given through intramuscular or intravenous uh, may suit just as well. In, in our particular clinics, uh, we're using both lozenges and intramuscular uh, and, and the rationale is um, with IV and, and this just speaks to our philosophy, uh, which is we lean into the psychedelic effect and with IV it's a slower administration, uh, and so people don't necessarily have as intense a trip uh, as um, as you would with an intramuscular injection, and that's why we lean towards intramuscular, because we want people to have that psychedelic experience, and we want people to be able to unpack those experiences. Uh, all of it, again, is, is legal. The regulatory environment is all the same. Uh, there may be some restrictions on what clinics, uh, what what criteria clinics have to meet. They may have to satisfy out of hospital premise uh, criteria and all that kind of stuff. But again, those are, are just, you know, requirements of how the clinic's set up, not necessarily a bar to what's legal or regulatorily permitted. Um, could you just dive into quickly, Ronan, um, maybe give us just a high level, what, what does this clinic experience look like? 
Yeah, so for us, uh, we are treating it part of a psychotherapy. You know, for us, this is all about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So the drug is uh, catalyzing the psychotherapy and, and the effects of what's largely CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy. So with our, our clinics, patients will come in, they'll be vetted by a psychiatrist, they'll meet uh, with a clinical psychologist as well. We'll make sure that physically they uh, are, are healthy enough to have a ketamine experience because it is not appropriate for everyone. Uh, assuming that everything is good, what will happen is patients will have uh, two ketamine sessions, uh, which last about 45 minutes to an hour when you're in the dissociative psychedelic state, uh, followed by exploratory therapy. Um, and then after two sessions of ketamine and exploratory therapy, then you'll do an integration therapy. So we're following protocols, uh, both in terms of the number of administrations of ketamine, uh, as well as the, the therapeutic protocols, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, both evidence-based, you know, we're one of the first really integrating the two. So uh, it is a novel, uh, a novel experience, but that's what a patient experience will typically look like. Uh, and then they'll do a course of six total ketamine treatments, three integration therapy sessions and, and then you know depending on the patient's needs and, and where they are at the end of that they'll, they'll come back or hopefully they'll have relief from the symptoms that they don't necessarily need to continue treatment uh, for the immediate duration. Oh, it's so interesting um, you know I'd like to maybe now move this discussion over to Timothy if you don't mind um, maybe you could maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how how are we looking at and, and we've had this discussion before but um, the focus really around psychedelics being used uh, to treat addiction um, is mainly used for opioid addiction. Is that correct? Yeah, certainly. I think opioids are a very sort of obvious and apparent problem. Um, like mirroring uh, something that Roger mentioned, this uh, pandemic and the associated quarantine, all these sort of uh, adjusted social measure, measures that have taken place have resulted in a sort of like, you know, as of yet unseen cresting tidal wave of mental illness and disorder and sort of on the ground sort of visible in Vancouver it has been a spike in opiate use disorder related overdoses and deaths. I think in the uh, month of April we had about 180 deaths which is a mind-blowing number. It is yeah. preposterous to think. I mean the, the opiate use deaths outnumber the actual COVID deaths uh, locally here. So. Um, if there is a, you know, apparent, you know, crisis, it's there. Um, but yeah, so it is one of many. But ultimately, I think what's really important to note is that though the actual sort of drug or molecule or the substance of use may differ and it might have a bunch of different um, sort of like um, behavioral outcomes, uh, you know, and different sort of uh, different versions of that, uh, that sort of chaos, um, what underpins much of addiction is a much deeper sort of underlying um, sort of psycho, like, you know, psychological and emotional turmoil. Um, you know, I think it was Gabor Mate that said, who works deeply in the uh, downtown east side, that up to 99% of the people that he sees that are addicted to substances have some instance of trauma. And I think that's a really important thing to note that if trauma is the basis of addiction, um, you know, a lot of uh, really Negative things come as a result of trauma, such as like that inhibit the work that is necessary to unpack addiction. Um, you know, trauma results in trauma avoidance and makes that sort of very necessary work of working through objectively that internal landscape. It makes it really difficult. And so as I witnessed sort of watching my brother and sort of hearing the tales of a lot of people like, you know, people that have addiction generally have some pretty acute trauma events. Um, and the very necessary work of like going through that, you know, where that uh, pain originates, it's very difficult, um, you know, because the pain is just so immense. Um, psychedelics are very useful in that, and that's what we're doing. We're developing a sort of psychedelic DMT-based treatment so that these people can access this stuff, you know, in a sort of beautiful like uh, environment. Um, the experience itself is very um, sort of like, it helps facilitate that. It sort of wraps it in a feeling of, uh, you know, of wonder and enjoyment, um, but also, you know, helps to dive into the very sort of crucial nature of what that person's internal composition is. So, um, yeah. Well, I if think I just, that... If I could just quickly jump in there. Um, Tim, completely agree with everything you're saying. Uh, another area that we're seeing, um, seeing progress made in terms of addiction and psychedelics is cocaine addiction. Uh, yep. So one of our team members, Peter Hendricks, is running a study at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where they are taking um, primarily uh, uh, lower income, uh, deeply addicted crack cocaine users 
and uh, through a course of psilocybin therapy, seeing tremendous benefits and uh, very promising initial early research there. No, oh, totally. Yeah, and just to uh, sort of expand on that, there's been a lot of really amazing work with uh, with regard to LSD and the treatment of alcoholism, um, as well as you know one of our advisors, Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins, has done some pretty phenomenal work in treating people with nicotine addictions. Um, sort of outcome mm -hmm. of that study have proven to be twice as effective as anything else on the market. So, um, yeah, it, there is um, there are very specific mechanisms that classic psychedelics work on to help facilitate some of this change that sort of results in introspective ability. Uh, dysregulation of default mode network, synaptic entropy, things that enable new, I guess, neurological connections to be made so that new perceptions and new feelings uh, and beliefs can be generated. And for people with very deeply entrenched addiction issues, often the idea of any behavioral change or belief changes is nearly impossible because, uh, you know, some of that sort of default patterning is so strong and sort of helps perpetuate that. So psychedelics you know, broad range of psychedelics help to affect that. And I think, you know, we think that with DMT due to its short acting and powerful nature can be delivered in the most, um, I guess, uh, scalable and customizable way in such, in such a way that, you know, a lot of these psychedelics are amazing and they're proven effective, but um, there's some shortcomings to some of the longer form on psychedelics, both from a sort of clinical scalability perspective, also from the perspective of safety. Um, you know, though these experiences are meaningful and powerful, um, once put into the hands of thousands and millions of people, um, you know, a six to 12 hour, uh, you know, uh, psychedelic experience, there's a lot of opportunity for negative adverse effects, but with DMT, it's possible to, um, you know, should that person um, experience anything sort of too distressing to handle, uh, able to stop that experience and return them to normal, a uh, sort of functional baseline within uh, five to 10 minutes. Right. You know, um, and and just to jump Sorry. in with what Tim said, I think, you know, I mean, I know people participating today have very different backgrounds. So uh, just to be clear, so when people have uh, misuse of substances that are illicit or illegal or cannabis or alcohol and nicotine, what's been shown in the neuroscience in the last two decades is that the underlying brain circuits that are related to this type of behavior are not identical, but pretty similar. Yeah. And the hypothesis, the hypothesis is that psychedelics may reset those circuits, kind of like resetting the motherboard on your computer when it's not I've quite operating with you. Yeah, and what's critical though to keep in mind, and this is something that we need to always be, uh, have a bit of uh, kind of humbleness about this. What we're talking about is one indication, one psychedelic, ketamine depression. Everything else is a testable hypothesis. So we've got emerging evidence in the disorders you heard about, like nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, opioids, cannabis, but there's a fair way to go. And our hope is, our hope is, is that that promise, and there's promise there now, can get across what we call phase three. And again, phase three is the FDA approval process. But unfortunately, for treatments that work very, very well, because they got across the finish line, they actually fail 85% of the time. So there's a lot of risk here, unless the appropriate people are developing them. So we all agree these are terrible disorders, terrible public health problems, especially opioid overdose, et cetera. My concern is that we won't see the light of day for some of these treatments unless the right organizations are shepherding them. And it's very, very important people be aware of where these products are with respect to their landing on the runway. Yeah, no, fair. And I, I echo that also, I think. Um, these indications have, um, they, you know, they require a lot of time and money and they have to be very rigorously and specifically, um, the studies need to be very specifically and rigorously um, sort of structured to ensure that, yes, like for the target indication, there is a provable measure of efficacy. And yeah, of course, the human capital is uh, absolutely necessary. And so, um, you know, in our team, yeah, we went into the formation of it with that in mind, that who are the people with the most experienced both in, re in the realm of the psychedelic research uh, to help form the protocol development, but also who can operationalize this? Who has the actual sort of, yeah, developmental level to bring these to market? And so, yes, it's, it, is a, um, it is a highly rigorous and difficult environment to operate in. So we all have to be very pointed about what we do. And um, yeah, I agree with you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and I just want to jump in there because one thing I want to get to before we have to go to um, Q&A, and uh, I could chat with you guys forever. Um, Ian, you are working and developing um, or developing some research around something called cluster headaches. Do you want to tell us what cluster headaches are and, and kind of the work that you're doing towards that? Yeah, for sure. I'll keep it brief. So cluster headache is a disease that affects roughly one in a thousand people. Um, if, if these aren't migraines, if migraine was say a five and a half out of 10 on a pain scale, giving birth is a 7.2. This is a 9.7 out of 10. It is the most intense pain that has been uh, that has been characterized by man. The pain is so bad that um, for people who have this uh, have this disorder, the suicide rate is 10 to 20 times the national average. They will bang their head against a wall, do anything to distract from the pain that they're feeling from a cluster headache. Um, and these attacks happen uh, roughly three and a half times per day uh, while they're on their episode at an average duration of around 45 minutes. So it completely ruins, uh, completely ruins a, a lot of lives. Um, the current medications that are on the market are not good enough. They work for some of the people some of the time. Um, but what does work are uh, psychedelics. So what we're doing at Bright Minds is fine-tuning um, fine tuning the molecule to uh, to treat that disorder um, and just to uh, to the to the point in the previous conversation about endpoints being hard which is trying to prove that your drug is effective for, for laymen um, that is notoriously difficult in psychiatric indication um, if you're talking about cluster headache it's much more black and white either you have a searing pain in your head and you and you feel like you want to uh, bang your head against the wall or you don't um, so we believe from a clinical standpoint, uh, that will be an easier indication to get through. Um, also, uh, touching on that, on, on the de-risking, we have um, added a regulatory, uh, a regulatory person who is specialized in, uh, has run um, cluster headache trials before. And we've also added a chief medical officer who has experience in headache dealing with the FDA and, and knows the, the clinical protocol there. So. Um, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty on cluster headache. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, again, I wish we had much longer to chat, um, but I will make sure that people have the ability to reach out to you guys so they have individual questions. I have a few I'm gonna try and get through before the end of this. Um, one that's come up is with the negative connotations associated with the word psychedelics, more people have started using entheogens Hopefully I said that okay. Um, are you also seeing this and can you see adopting this name to gain wide acceptance in the clinical realm? So I guess it's just more of kind of rebranding, um, you know, it as a sector. You know, I'll make a approach that first. I mean, the, the, the monikers and theogens, that's right. It's like a, it's almost a religious type experience. Um, it's turned out in the FDA's recognized this with ketamine that having a trip is not critical to the therapeutic effect of these drugs. Uh, it may be uh, related to the efficacy for some people, but not essential, and the FDA recognizes that. So I would be very skeptical if entheogen, meaning sort of a, you know, sort of an internal religious experience uh, trip, uh, would in fact be the new class name. I think you're going to see the FDA uh, for now stay with the name of the products like ketamine or if psilocybin gets across the finish line. As we speak, a group of us internationally are working on a new nomenclature, a new glossary of how to name all these drugs, but entheogen is not really part of our vocabulary and not part of the vocabulary that we're looking at for the future. Interesting. I, I, also, I also don't think psychedelics have um, such a negative reputation. Maybe historically they had a stigma, but that's changing extremely quickly. You know, you just have to pick up any media outlet these days and they're talking about psychedelics uh, pretty openly and candidly. And, and I think, you know, I think cannabis has done a lot of the work to change yeah. once held stigmas. Absolutely. Ronan, one, one question that came up as well, maybe I can just stay with you on this one is how long is a typical treatment of ketamine? How long does a patient feel the effects of it? It can vary, but uh, typically 45 minutes to an hour in a dissociative state. Some people take a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter. Typically, uh, someone's in our clinic for three to four hours before and after kind of time uh, committed to the, the ketamine, the, the therapy session, and then just kind of reconnecting and, and getting back into kind of normal state. 
Awesome. And and one question back to you, Ian, if you don't mind. James is here to tell us that we have to wrap up. But one question that came up, Ian, is he uh, somebody was asking, what, what drug are you using um, in research against cluster headaches? Uh, we have a couple different chemo types. So chemo type is basically the, the, the structure that we're basing it off of. Um, some drugs look structurally similar to psilocybin. Others we have basically created through a high throughput screening um, program. Uh, so I guess the, the short answer is some, some look like psilocybin and uh, others are, are different, but they all, all work on uh, mechanism. Awesome. Thank you all for everything today. Um, you know, there's, there's so much more to learn, but thank you for bringing your expertise. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for organizing this. Take care. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everyone, for your great insights today. And that doesn't stop with this panel. Anna, wonderful job. And also, thank you, CSE and CFN, for sponsoring. But um, everyone who's watching, you do not want to miss. If you like this panel, which was awesome, you definitely don't want to miss the next one. It's about mushrooms. And uh, we definitely have a great cast of characters who are ready to talk about that particular uh, subject matter. So the link will come to you right now on the bottom of your screen on the right. I also posted it in the comments. Um, pretty easy. If you got into this one, you'll get into it the same way. Uh, and again, thank you, everyone. Great job. And we look forward to doing more business with you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.